uh, the Grand Round speaker this morning. It's Zach Brook, um, who has been here for the last couple of days uh, giving lectures. And um, uh, Dr. Brook uh, is a professor of pediatrics at Georgetown University School of Medicine in uh, Washington, D.C. He was born and raised in Haifa, Israel, up on the northern tip of Israel on the Mediterranean Sea. Graduated from high school there and went on to obtain his uh, medical degree at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And um, finishing in 1968, and did his pediatric residency uh, at uh, Kaplan Hospital, finishing in 1974. I should say along the way, Dr. Brook, as is the case with all men in Israel, was called to active duty in the Israeli army during the Six Day War in 1967, interrupting medical school uh, within a couple of weeks of graduation, and um, then returned to finish uh, medical school and began residency, which was also interrupted during his third year of residency for the Yom Kippur War uh, as a battalion surgeon. Uh, during that conflict, he was seriously wounded in the leg and head, uh, and. Uh, uh, and then uh, recovering from that, he uh, came to the United States and uh, began his fellowship in adult and pediatric infectious disease with Sidney Feingold at UCLA School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Feingold still living and is one of the legendary uh, investigators uh, in infectious disease, uh, particularly in anaerobic infections, and inspired Dr. Brook to pursue that, that uh, path in medicine. and. Uh, he served in the Navy for 27 years, uh, which is where I first met him. I wasn't in the Navy, but I was in the Army. And uh, six years after Dr. Brooke finished his fellowship, I began mine in the Army, and my program director wasted no time letting me know who this uh, young investigator was who was publishing uh, uh, article after article on head and neck infections and anaerobic infections. Uh, he's been at Georgetown University since retirement and, uh, and uh, is uh, uh, here today uh, to talk to us about his experience that I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, he's published uh, uh, numerous articles. He's been on numerous committees uh, in Washington, D.C. You're, if you're known for something, you're going to probably be called to be on committees. And he's been on so many committees, it's uh, un impossible to list, but one of the important things is he was the uh, chair of the Anti-Infective Drug Advisory Committee of the FDA in the mid-1980s, which he still functions as an advisor. Uh, his CV is, is right at 100 pages with uh, over 700 um, scientific articles published, uh, 105 book chapters, and uh, at last count, 10 textbooks. I bought the, his definitive uh, textbook of pediatric anaerobic infections a long time ago, as soon as it came out. But uh, he's also got uh, literature on specifically on uh, head and neck infections and sinus infections, um, as shown here. And uh, I'm not showing all of them. Just to give you a, a, an idea, of, uh, Dr. Brook is a, is a prolific writer, and his books are always well received. Um, in 2006, he was diagnosed with hypopharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, uh, which failed uh, radiation therapy and then underwent a, a radical uh, neck surgery. Uh, and along the way, he discovered what it's like to be a patient on the other side of the white coat. And uh, it inspired him uh, to, uh, to document and relate some of his experiences for educational purposes in his most recent book called My Voice, uh, subtitled A Physician's Personal Experience with Throat Cancer. And uh, you can, he's, there are some of these cards out on the table. If you're interested, you can actually read this online uh, for free or uh, some residents, if interested in having it, there's a grant uh, by which you can uh, take advantage of and receive one of these books. Um, uh, a courtesy of a grant. You all should have a, a, just a simple one-page handout, which is, uh, is a, a bit of a summary of today's presentation. So uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Brook to the lectern, and, uh, uh, and he is going to, uh, let me just switch our things here, close that. And 
Dr. Brooks is going to use a handheld microphone uh, to uh, better uh, be heard, but I think you'll find it easy to understand. Hey, good morning. Thank James for uh, uh, introducing me. Hey, I'm very pleased to be here today and talk to you about my experience as a patient who uh, had laryngeal cancer, I'm sorry, hypopharyngeal cancer. It's definitely a life-changing uh, experience for me. And um, I will try to share with you some of my experiences and how it affected my life. Uh, a few words of how I speak and I apologize for my voice. Uh, I don't have vocal cords and uh, I express, I speak through a prosthesis, a small prosthesis that links my trachea and esophagus. Hey, my, it's a IV. Automatically, it's done automatically. Hey, whenever I wish to speak, air is shifted from the trachea to the esophagus. And uh, the vibration of the esophagus create my voice. So, hey, this is how I speak. And uh, it's a challenging uh, thing for me. And I hope it won't be so hard for you to understand me. Uh, neck and the cancer is a devastating illness uh, in many ways, more than other types of cancer. And this is because it affects the patient in many, many ways. It affects uh, the way they communicate. It affects the way they eat and also how they look. And that is why uh, many, many patients find that life afterwards is quite challenging. It's a kind of cancer you cannot hide from others. And in some ways it's a positive thing. I see this way because it's a living with it is a proof that life can go on even after having a serious illness. Let me share with you what I experienced as I faced the diagnosis of cancer. I, it was a shattering reality to learn uh, that uh, I may see the end of the road. And, uh, I always felt that uh, in many ways I was able to have overcome uh, mortality, perhaps because I survived a couple of wars and was in serious uh, dangerous situations a few times in my life and I always made it. Uh, so I was shocked when I was told by my a otolaryngologist that uh, this is a malignant tumor. Uh, I lost trust in my own body uh, to deal with the illness. Uh, I somehow envisioned that I would die one day, perhaps like my father did from a heart attack. But I realized that uh, I need to deal with, with life and death conditions unexpectedly. It was difficult to get used to the idea that my future is uncertain and that I wouldn't know exactly if and when a recurrence will come. And when it did come, about a year and a half later, I was again shaken and had to face difficult conditions. I had to become dependent on others, at least initially. I, after my surgery, I am realizing that uh, it will affect my work, my relationships with people, and I had immediately to decide major issues right away. For example,
person to take care of you. And it doesn't always mean surgery. It can be also in medicine and any other type of treatment. I realize that they, at least in my case, because hypopharyngeal and throat cancer are not as common as they used to be. Expertise are not so great in every place. And I chose and confused friendliness and uh, good bedside manners with knowledge. And uh, in retrospect, I should have probably had my initial treatment at the place that they was doing the procedure I needed, which was a laser surgery at the place that does it all the time, rather than does it once or twice a year. And that's what I learned. And I also learned, and I emphasize to others all the time now, either the second opinion and even a third opinion is very important. There could always be another view. There's really very little that is definite in medicine or surgery. And each patient is different. So getting another opinion is very, very important. Another thing I realized is that my state of mind, and I think you know it only when you become a patient with a serious illness, my state of mind was very different than not always logical. I was so much under an internal pressure to get better, to remove this cancer right away, that my way of thinking was not always the most logical. For example, I would urge my doctors to operate and remove it rather than wait and get another opinion or get another test. Also, I was not able to listen to everything they were telling me, even though even though they did a terrific job in explaining to me again and again what is needed, what will happen, and how life will be later. And I think that I listened, but I was not always internalizing what they were saying. And they, when I had become a laryngectomy, and realize how difficult and different life is. The word that they told me came back to me, but no words can exactly explain and illustrate to you how it feels to be later. After the procedure, how it will be exactly like. So what I'm telling you, you need to realize may not always internalize everything and you need to repeat it to your best but you may have to see them shocked or bewildered or not completely ready afterwards and it's not only in head and neck cancer but also in other types of cancer this is why it's important to have a patient advocate with a patient a family member, a friend, somebody who can also listen to what you are telling the patient so that they could make life easier for them later. I uh, met uh, two types of doctors, the optimist and the pessimist. Those who see the cup half full or those who see it half empty. My personal preference is to know the truth, but um, I think that if I had to 
suggest something, I would try to be an optimist and try to paint it in a way that will give hope. But you need to judge every person differently. I've seen people in my career who could not really deal with the real truth. Or if you need to use your judgment, some people don't want to know it, and it's okay as long as family members understand it. What I also realized is that when I was treated in several medical centers, in a place where the load of work wasn't very hard, I got a lot of attention from clinicians. But in other places, when the surgeons were extremely busy, starting rounds at 5.30 in the morning and operating until 9 or 10 o'clock at night sometimes. They had very little time to spend with me at least after the surgery was done. And this is really when I needed time. I needed to ask questions without being able to speak, which was very, very challenging. I had to write it. Patience is very, very important. You need to do it. The mental status of the patient is as important as their physical status. I've seen patients with laryngectomy who gave up on life. Even though they were successfully treated, they really deteriorated emotionally to the point that was no meaningful life afterwards. Also showing the patient that you care is very, very important. One of my otolaryngologists always hugged me and his hug meant more than everything else he did for me. He doesn't always have to a physical hug, an emotional knowledge that the pure physician really cares for you, makes all the difference for the patient who is in a difficult condition. I never hugged patients until I became a patient myself. I always believed in maintaining professional distance. You need to find your own way of hugging your patients. Some may do it physically, but others can find other ways. What was very helpful for me was to meet other laryngectomies prior to the surgery for two reasons, to see that they can still speak and also to see that life is still possible. Afterwards, there are still things that can be done. One of the mistakes I made in my case is not to enable me to speak after my surgery by not providing me an electrolarynx and electrolarynx to those of those who you do not know is a mechanical instrument the size of my that they produces vibration and by placing it in the neck uh, you can actually speak in a very mechanical way but at least it allows you to speak. They wanted me not to get used to it because they wanted me to adapt what I'm using now which is most similar to my old voice but enabling the patient to speak right away. To you, those of you who are ENT, I would suggest that you try and let them do it as quickly as possible. Having somebody with me, an advocate, it was my daughter, who did it initially, and later 
was in med school. I worked as a nurse to uh, to supplement my salary, my income. I knew what was done wrong, and uh, there were one or two serious mistakes every day, almost like giving me medication that was needed to be given intramuscularly, orally, or in not. Dissolving the pills correctly, or taking the blood pressure in the wrong size cuff, which created abnormal results, and so on and so forth. There were serious mistakes like feeding me a week too early because the nurse transcribed the error on the wrong chart that the order the wrong chart. Those are some of the mistakes. One of the most serious one was that I was in the ICU and I had my I had a plug of mucus in my throat and because my call button fell I couldn't call for help. It took five minutes until I finally got suctions for me. It felt forever. So I think the errors can be minimized to some degree. If there is, of course, the willingness to listen to what patients tell to correct mistakes. But it's good for the patient to have somebody with them so that they can prevent those errors and again training discussion admission if you made a mistake is very very important it is a big difference if you know that there are things you don't have to worry about unfortunately in realizing that mistakes are made all the time makes it more difficult for the patient. I had to watch all the time and make sure that there are no mistakes being made. And also, you need to explain what will happen and do it again and again. Life as a patient after a serious procedure is very, very challenging and difficult. And your attention and patience is very, very important. It's not only what you do in the whole hour. It's what you do before and after that's important. After surgery, the challenges to the patient is immense. I was repeatedly asking myself, am I really cured? For the first few months, and even longer, every little pain or 
so much technology that can, they think can substitute for a good physical exam. Another important lesson I learned is that it's important not to ignore other medical issues. When I was diagnosed, I told my ENT in a sarcastic way, well, the only good thing about this is at least I'll know now what I'm going to die from. He told me, no, you're not going to die from your cancer. Very likely not. We caught it still very early. And I hope he's right and he's right so far. But he told me you need to remember not to ignore other medical issues. Cancer looks so big and threatening. But people who get older get hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, liver disease. It's important not to forget it. And I definitely agree with this. And unfortunately, many patients focus only on their ENT problem or other major cancer they have and ignore other issues. Speaking again was very challenging for me. I had to use the right method to speak. In my case, since I had a, a flap, I had a free flap that reconstructed my larynx. That flap is hypotonic, and that is why my voice is so weak. But there are other ways of speaking, which include esophageal speech, which I uh, try to learn and I know a little, or electrolarynx. A patient needs to make a choice. It's a challenging thing to be understood. My voice, even though you can hear me well, is not always there for me. I can lose it if there is a leak of air, if the prosthesis is going to be clogged. So it's a very fragile way, voice. There is also life challenges. Discrimination is something that I experience. Uh, initially, my voice was worse, and there were many conditions and situations. People uh, decided not to ask me to talk or sit on a committee or uh, even answer my phone. Even today, I prefer to have my wife answer the phone because uh, I'm afraid of somebody closing the phone right away, hanging up on me. So it's not always a an easy life and there is discrimination. People who are younger than me and still have a long career ahead of them. And unfortunately, throat cancer is now very common in young people. Have a much larger, much bigger challenge to live. Hey, we see now an epidemic of a tongue and through oral cancer due to HPV virus, and that makes a much more tremendous effect on young people's life than the kind of cancer that I had. One of the most important supportive thing that I had was having speech therapists that were dedicated and helping. Initially speaking was so difficult for me and I often needed to go to my speech therapist once or twice a week knowing that she's there for me all the time made all the difference. Also knowing that my ENT was there for me all the time made me feel more secure initially. And that is a very, very important thing to know. Learning to speak and to take care of this 
here over time. Swelling, edema, decreases when things do get better. It is important to tell this to your patients. It's not going to be as bad now in the future. Life itself is a learning check to me. It's challenging. Those are some of the issues one has to deal with. Eating and swallowing is not easy. Hydration is difficult sometimes when there is a leak of the prosthesis. Reflux is happening. Radiation induces stiffness of the muscles and limited mobility, which can be a challenge driving or even exercising. The production of sputum is very difficult initially, but the two gets better over time. And maintaining good stomach health are other issues too. The radiation affects the teeth, and uh, getting dental care is not as easy after radiation. One needs sometimes to get a hyperbaric oxygen if the procedures are done at the lower jaw or areas that are um, radiated. And it's important to have a team effort when caring for a patient. Again, it's only laryngectomy, but it's not only laryngectomy. But in case of laryngectomy, we need a speech pathologist, nutritionist, social and medical teams to work together and coordinate an approach. One of the challenges that I had, and many do, is getting care in an emergency. We need to get air to the trachea, not to the nose. I got to the emergency room several times and got the air to my nose. Every year they estimated about 20 neck breather is a die or get severe brain damage because they don't get the oxygen in the correct way. There is a video that I prepared to teach how to do it correctly and it's available on my blog and I it also if you write me I'll be happy to send you a copy of it. I have one copy with me here that I can leave with you but it's important to train emergency room men also EMTs about the right way of caring for a patient with laryngectomy. Psychological issues are very, very important. And this is a, as important as a medical condition. You don't want the patient to be isolated. You don't want them to get into depression, substance abuse, and they one day away. one way of preventing it is being proactive, getting the patient to see a psychologist, social worker. I see I saw a social worker before the surgery and afterwards, and I kept seeing her for a couple of years later. It helps. Some people may need medication. It's a challenge, especially after throat cancer, because of the difficulty to speak and communicate. A support system is very important. Family supports, friends. There are support group for every type of cancer. I go to a laryngectomy support group initially to get help. And now I can help others. I try and meet laryngectomy patients in my hospital before surgery. And there are other volunteers in our support group that meet them at other places. It's very, very important to have a group support. In my case, 
had a own depression which I did. And I, the thing that motivated me more than anything else was that I did not want to leave my kids. An example of how I dealt with a difficult condition and a challenge in my life. I knew that unfortunately life may also give them a difficult challenge in the future and I did not want them to remember that their father gave up in the same when he had a difficult condition. And that is very, at least in my case, what motivated me. Uh, returning to work, uh, returning to teaching, seeing patients again, building new relationships with other people uh, that had this condition were very, very important. For me, I needed to find a new purpose for my life. I realized that uh, having a throat cancer wasn't something I wanted, but I wanted to make the best out of a bad condition so that I can use my own, uh, I don't want to say a tragedy, but my own uh, bad luck into something positive to help others. And this is why I uh, wrote the book, I wrote articles on this, and I try and speak to support group and laryngectomies and physicians about my own experience so that I can use my set setback in a positive way. There are good things about there being a laryngectomy too. I don't snore anymore. I don't have uh, to wear a tie. I always hated them. And uh, I don't have to smell bad smells. Uh, I always ate cigarettes. My, my smell came back. So when I see somebody smell, I do this. And I can still breathe, but not smell. And that's a, that's an advantage. Also, we don't get colds as much as other people because we breathe not through our nose. And the respiratory viruses need to first colonize the nose mucosa. So I had known colds since I became a laryngectomy. And I think one important message is that uh, since we show and cannot hide our uh, cancer or our disability, we can still set an example that life can still go on despite the uh, cancer. Let me just show you a short five-minute video that sort of tells you a little bit about my life as a laryngectomy that was captured by a local TV station. And I think you may find it interesting. Doctors are used to being the ones giving the advice, not the ones receiving it. But there was a physician at Georgetown University Hospital who has had to deal with a life-altering illness, and what he's learned goes way beyond any medical school textbook. As Fox Eyes Beth Parker shows us, he is now trying to make sure his message is heard. For someone who speaks in a whisper, Hi, good morning. Itzhak Brook has a very big voice. Brook was born in Israel. He served in the Israeli army during the Yom Kippur War in the 70s. But he says the cancer that took his voice was his toughest opponent ever. It's more difficult day than even being in a war. Because in the war you are with friends. You can speak. You can share. You can see the danger. But this is so out of control. Because cancer has its own life and its own way of acting. 
Brooke retired as a doctor in the U.S. Navy and is a pediatrician at Georgetown with a specialty in infectious disease. He had spent years working in hospitals, but not much time in the hospital until one day in 2006 when his throat began to hurt. I felt a soreness in my throat, and uh, it didn't go away after about two or three weeks. A biopsy revealed cancer. I was shaken. I couldn't believe it that I had cancer. But there it was. I needed to deal with it. He did. But a year and a half later, the cancer had returned. And this time, doctors told him he had to make a choice, lose his larynx or run a great risk of cancer costing him his life. It's a choice he'd actually thought about as a healthy young man studying to become a doctor. I was really astounded and shocked. And I said to myself, if I had to make a choice like this to live without a voice, I would rather die. But when I had to choose for myself, when I had to make a choice, it was no brainer, of course. Brooke now speaks with help from a reconstructed airway and a prosthetic device. My voice now is the same as it was before. Even my foreign accent, my Israeli accent is still there. It's just whispery and weak. While there have been times when he wanted to give up, he says he kept going for a chance to see his grandchildren and a chance to inspire his children. I knew that one day they may too have to deal with adversity. And I wanted them to remember that their father didn't give up. He still kept trying to make something out of his life. He has certainly done that. Do you think you're a better doctor now? I'm sure I am. So he became a better doctor, but for Brooke, that wasn't enough. He wanted other physicians to understand not just what it means to be a doctor, but also how it feels to be a patient. As a patient, I felt how difficult it was on the other side of the stethoscope. When doctors are rushed and busy, when nurses have so many other patients, they don't have time to you and to take care of what you need. Esophagus sits behind the... Dr. Bruce Davidson is the chair of the Department of Otolaryngology at Georgetown and a head and neck surgeon. Stick your tongue out to the left. <clears throat> right. As a resident, Davidson used to read journal articles written by Brooke. Now he is Brooke's doctor and is still learning from him. There is certainly a perspective that he brings that nobody else can really bring to the table, even if you're the treating physician of hundreds of patients. Having seen things from his perspective, I think, educates all of us. Ironically, this man whose voice was taken away is educating by talking. With the help of a microphone, Brooke lectures to doctors and medical students around the country. He's even written a book urging communication and compassion. It's very, very important to be compassionate and humane and patient and listen. Listen to the patient. Hey, understand what the patient is thinking and feeling. How terrifying it is to be in a big place with tubes and catheters and IVs and machines around you and your life is at the end of other people and there's so much unknown. He takes extra time to show patients not just his knowledge but also his heart. Let me also examine your teddy bear. He's okay. He remembers being the one in that bed. There was one doctor who dug me every time A powerful message, even when spoken in a whisper. So it doesn't hurt so much. It's good. In Washington, Beth Parker, Fox 5 News. So many profound messages there. To read Dr. Brooks' blog, you can go to myfoxdc.com and look under web links.
Any questions for Dr. Brook? or comments I think uh, you, you've seen a preview I think of what's going to be the keynote lecture at the annual uh, uh, College of Otolaryngologists uh, this year in Washington DC so uh, we're it's really an honor to have uh, Ed Zach come here to to tell us his story and uh, teach us a little bit about this uh, this reminds me of a play I saw in New York one time called Wit uh, it's a fictitious story about an a English professor who was dying of terminal ovarian cancer. And the whole play, there was no music. It was just dialogue of her in her room being taken care of by sometimes former undergraduate students um, having to examine her. And it, it had some humor, but it also touched on a lot of the points that uh, Dr. Brooke made this morning. Uh, I think it's, uh, it will do us all well to keep some of these things in mind. Any other comments or questions? Well, thank have, you, have you seen a movie uh, from about 25 years ago? Uh, is it called yep. The Doctor? Or yes. A cardiothoracic surgeon. He was making fun of the ENT doctor, and then he ended up having to have a partial laryngectomy or something. Yes. What, is that The Doctor? Or yes, it's The Doctor. It's actually based on a book that was written about 30 years ago. Yes. And I read the book. Very, very interesting. Very humbling to realize how it feels to be a patient. And um, it's a very, John Hart played the doctor. And you're right, it, it, it goes through the same issues. That suddenly you become dependent on other people. And you realize how maybe you have hurt people by not being sensitive. Enough yourself. The humanity of medicine is very, very important, and that's uh, been seen in that movie too. From somebody who was uh, distant, he becomes more caring and humane. The best scene from that movie is when uh, the, the cardiac surgeon had recovered, and he was making all the residents round with him. Right, on, right. Rear's kind of halfway out in the breeze and everything, just so they, they would appreciate what it's like. Yeah, I'd say it's very humbling. Any other comments? Yes.
This was now a partial or complete laryngectomy that I did not dwell on the fact that the attending missed it. He, he was a dear friend of mine and still is. I, I still go to him every two months now for my checkups. I like him, I like him a lot as a person. And I still see him. I know now that uh, he's going to be very careful, which he is. It's not Dr. Davidson. Dr. Davidson is in Georgetown. It, uh, that uh, everything was in the Navy Hospital in Bethesda, where I was still in military in the military when it happened. And uh, the initial diagnosis, I don't have ill feeling toward him. I wish he would have done a better job. Um, there is a, and I didn't bring it out today, but it's more in my book. Uh, when they offered me to have endoscopic surgery, they told me uh, that there are other places around the country, and I, uh, I didn't ask them how many endoscopic surgeries did you do before until two days before the surgery. And the answer was one on your type of cancer. And I know now that the centers who do it every week in St. Louis, in Phoenix, in Jacksonville, and also in Germany where they all started. And uh, I should have gone there if I wanted endoscopic surgery. And the reality was that my doctors failed in removing it endoscopically. And after doing it, the area was so swollen that uh, going to endoscopy again was not uh, an option immediately. So I elected to have laryngectomy to get it out before it metastasizes. So in retrospect, I should have gone to a place that had more experience. And they uh, meant well, but they probably did not represent their expertise in a straightforward way. That's my only criticism. But I still uh, like love them as human beings. They are wonderful people. They're Just they were not uh, straight with uh, telling what they actually knew. Navy, right? Okay. I was I was Walter Reed, so we have a natural little army. No, Navy there was one hospital. Uh, yes, Trey. Really? 
who had to choose between laryngectomy and endoscopic surgery the same choice. And I told her the options. And um, I told her how it's going to be challenging and difficult. But in her case, if she would not have laryngectomy, she was going to run a great risk of recurrence and spread. It was a different kind of cancer. And she elected to have laryngectomy, which she had two days ago. But I think meeting people, talking to people, seeing that life is still possible, and she could still teach. She is a very strong person, and I think she will handle it.